Good, 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 good. My name is Pastor Doug, one of your associate pastors. It's a privilege to welcome you to worship this morning. Hope you've been having a good morning. Hopefully as you arrived, you either went by one of the kiosks and checked in and let us know you were attending, or maybe even after you came in, got seated, you grabbed our little uh, flashcard with the QR codes on it. I know I tell you this every week, but it's important information to us that you let us know you're in worship, you let us know what's going on in your life, if you have a prayer concern, uh, it's the pathway to uh, download the Treach app. So uh, it really is an important tool in the mission and ministry of everything that's going on here at church. Uh, there's a little bit of irony, I think, in uh, I'm about to point you to the announcement video, which is full of things to do. And then Daniel's about to come up here and tell you everything not to do to enjoy Sabbath. So uh, just find some balance in what you're doing and listening to, but let's see what's going on in the life of the church. Good morning, Treach. We've got a lot going on. Check out just a few of our upcoming events. First, Ash Wednesday and the holy season of Lent is just around the corner. Start off your Lenten season with a very special Ash Wednesday here at Treach. Join us at noon for an imposition of ashes, prayer time, and a word from Reverend Don Kirsch. At five, families with kids will be blessed by this service geared especially for them. Worship songs, prayers, and learning all to help children understand this special day. Then join us for our first Meal with Jesus at 6 p.m. in the Connection Center. Jesus often used meals as a way to build relationships and connect with the people around him. Our Lenten series, Meals with Jesus, will examine the teachings shared over a meal throughout Jesus' ministry. This will be a light meal of fruits, cheeses, meats, and breads, and some great fellowship opportunities. Then, join us at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary for a reflective service with music, a heartfelt message, and the imposition of ashes. Your Valentine's Day will be filled with the love of Christ. And make the most of your faith journey with Ed Drew's book, Meals with Jesus. These simple 10-minute family devotions explore Jesus' character through nine meals that he shared with people. You can purchase the book online or in the Connection Center. And join us in making a difference to our friends who are unhoused by participating in Blessing Bags. Purchase any items from the Amazon wish list and bring your donations February 4th through 18th to Mission U, just outside the sanctuary. On the 18th, we'll put together blessing bags. You can keep them in your car for the perfect time to bless someone. For more information on all of these and everything else going on at Treach, check out your digital bulletin in the Treach app or go to tmumc.org. And now it's time for worship. So one of my faithful Sabbath practices is every Sunday afternoon around 2 o'clock, I find myself prone on the couch, and I try to find an old rerun of a golf tournament with Jim Nance's soft voice in the background kind of lulling me into sleep. So I say all that to say, as you stand and greet your neighbor, tell them, yes, pro-nap or anti-nap? Which are you? Pro-nap. Be pro-nap today. Good morning, friends. All right. That was a lively discussion, Pastor Doug. <laughs> I would invite you to stand as you're able or remain standing and join me in our opening hymn. It's found on page 617 from a contemporary hymn writer, Brian Wren, I Come With Joy. Would you join as we sing? I come with joy to meet my Lord, forgiven, loved, and free. In awe and wonder to recall his life laid down for me. His life laid down for me. I come with Christians far and near to find. Christ. 
Would you please affirm your faith along with mine using the traditional and historic Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, you know, we kind of make a joke about taking a nap. Perhaps what we ought to do is be grateful for rest. And the way that God ordered and designed the world, um, really we don't have to prove how important we are by saying super busy all the time, do we? Perhaps our soul needs a little time to take a... Perhaps we need to let God do God's work in us while we're resting. What do you think about that? I think it is a good thing to slow down. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, there are so many ways you tell us you love us. The way you ordered the world, even in the midst of creation, oh God. You looked out and saw that it was good, and you set an example for us and rested. God, we confess that many times in our world, we get our value, not from being a beloved child of yours, but from being a busy person from people noticing and assuming that must mean we are really important, we have so much to do. That we get on that hamster wheel and we just spin it and spin it and spin it. It's as if we are trying to show off, indeed, how important we are, when in reality, we are running ourselves to death. Be with us, God. Help us not have to make an excuse for resting in your presence but to claim that time, to chisel that out, and to announce that it is a good and right thing that we rest. In our resting, we draw closer to you. In our resting, we might just hear you speak into our lives. We might see your handiwork more clearly and be reminded, as always, that we are your beloved. This we pray in your son's name. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Good to see you again. Good to see those who might be first-time guests this morning. We're always grateful for you. Hope this time will be a blessing for you. You certainly are for us. Also want to welcome our online community. We're always grateful for your presence. Hope this time will be a gift for you. Uh, you all are a gift to God and for the opportunity to celebrate in worship. We give thanks. So we begin this new worship series called uh, Unhurried, trying to figure out how it is we can live more fully and really faithfully into this relationship with God. And as I was reflecting on what it looks like to be unhurried, I got to thinking about rhythms in our lives. You all have kind of rhythms in your life, kind of rituals perhaps even that you do or enter into, right? Maybe in the morning, how you get ready to go in the uh, day, or maybe as you get ready for bed at night. I know I have rituals, right? And, and um, kind of rhythms, the, the very specific orderly things that we do. My family would call it OCD, but, you know, that's beside the point. And the staff sometimes makes fun of me because I, I kind of indicate when a meeting is over. Because when I'm ready to go, I just start stacking my stuff up and I'm ready to go, right? And that's an indication to everybody that uh, the rhythm has stopped and we need to move on, right? OCD is a funny thing because rhythms and rituals can sometimes feel and almost uh, uh, be the same thing. And yet life is full of rhythms, right? I mean, life itself is a rhythm, there is gestation, we're born, we live, we die, right? There's a whole cycle to all of that. There's that circadian rhythm. Are you familiar with that? The daily rhythm of life. And, and there are things that have input and import on that, right? Whether it's sunshine or not, or whether the food that we eat or not, and that circadian rhythm kind of indicates how we're going to move through the day. There are also those funky parts of life that have rhythm, like the estrogen cycle or the testosterone cycle in men, and I'm not a fan of either one of them, right? I don't know about you, but those rhythms are just there, and the, the rhythms can, when, when harnessed well, rhythms can kind of guide us into a fuller life. Rhythms can help us face each new day. Rhythms can help us uh, be more productive in all that we do, right? Those rhythms can be helpful. Unfortunately, we've somehow gotten caught up in some uh, rhythms that aren't always helpful. That's why we've called this series Unhurried, because many of us have gotten caught up without realizing it in a very hurried kind of rhythm, right? Uh, we get hurried in our work life. We get hurried in our, with our kids or grandkids' lives. We get hurried in how we need to get things done or accomplished. We get hurried in terms of traffic and rushing. Even our recreation can sometimes be very hurried and rushed. Often we'll come home from a vacation exhausted because we've tried to pack so much into it, right? We've lost sight of how it is we can enter into very productive, purposeful rhythms in our lives. And this hurriedness has become the norm. But I want to suggest to us that it's not normal for our faith. It's not the way God designed us. It's not the way God desires for us to live. And yet we find ourselves all caught up in it for any number of reasons. Sometimes it's technology. Sometimes it's our own personal choices. Sometimes it's things that kind of influence our lives and we're not 100% sure how we need to respond or what we need to do with that. But we find ourselves hurried. And a part of what I want to help us better understand, I hope, today is that God had a, a, a kind of a design or a desire from the very beginning with God's relationship with us that wants us to know that we don't have to live hurried, that we can live more faithfully in a close, deep relationship with God. Now, it started in what some would call the Mosaic Law or the Decalogue, you may know it, as the Ten Commandments. And sometimes I refer to them as the Big Ten, right? I mean, the Big Ten are those basic rules by which we ought to live. God established them centuries ago, and they were designed in order to help create order and relationship with God. And you know the Ten, and the fourth one is about Sabbath. And Exodus chapter 20 enumerates all ten, but I want to just read the Sabbath portion today to help remind us of the way in which God helps us to find a rhythm that is full and rich for life. This is how it starts. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Because the Lord, 
uh, made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. This is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Pretty straightforward, right? God created, uh, God took time to rest. God believes that uh, we need to take time to rest and we need to set that day aside as holy. It needs to be set apart. It needs to be distinctive. There's something special about that Sabbath day. And that was established in order that we might find life and wholeness in a relationship with God. Now, that went along pretty well, and, and, and the Israelites figured out a way to live into that and figured out a way to live for that, but they also figured out a way to take it so far that sometimes it lost its purpose. And so we look further into uh, the Torah, and we find in the Deuteronomist uh, version of this, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's the whole part that we just read, but then there's another addition that I think embraces a, a, a richer understanding of what we're supposed to be doing on the Sabbath. Listen to how the Deuteronomist puts it. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you to. Fair enough, that's the same, right? Six days you shall labor and do all your work. That's the same. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord our God. You should not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your towns so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So the Deuteronomist takes the concept of rest, which is very important and very base to the understanding of Sabbath, and then he expands it. He expands it for not only the rest of you, but all of your family and all of your servants and all of the people in community and all of your animals. He's trying to acknowledge that this is a rhythm not just for you as an individual, but for us as a collective body. And then he takes it even one step further, and he says, remember you were once slaves, and God took you out of that and brought you into freedom. Remember that you were encapsulated, and God set you free. Remember that the God who made all things made you for better and for a richer life, and therefore gave you freedom. Remember. And so part of what we begin to discover is that there's some rhythms about this Sabbath that become very important to help us become unhurried. And they're very straightforward. Rest is a rhythm and remembering is a rhythm. It's a way to begin to function so that we can find connection with God. And when we discover that rhythm and we live well into that rhythm, we actually discover life. We actually discover a, 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 an opportunity for there to be more. But a part of our dilemma is that we feel as though, man, I got too much to do. Uh, there's too many things that I need to achieve or too many uh, uh, things on my plate or that becomes a part of the problem. But then secondarily, what becomes a part of the problem is I can't give a whole day. I don't know how to do that. I can't make that function. And therefore, we tend to sort of negate and put off because we feel as though there's no way to achieve it. And what I want to suggest is that wasn't God's goal. That wasn't God's desire. God's desire was a connection, was a relationship. So let's talk about Sabbath just for a minute because I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by it. Sabbath as a word literally just means to cease or to rest. So what we are claiming is I'm going to cease from my everyday work. I'm going to cease from the common ordinary elements of life and I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to give my attention to who God is. Cease. In fact, um, Mark Buchanan is an author, and Mark wrote a book called The Rest of God, meaning rest in God, right? And in that, uh, a part of what he says is that Sabbath means to cease from the necessary and embrace what brings life. That sounds pretty cool, right? Cease from the necessary and embrace what brings life. That's God's intended goal, I think. That's God's desire for our hearts, 
And so instead of getting sort of encapsulated or caught up in, by golly, I can't do that, it's too hard, it's overwhelming, and I just, it's, there's no way I can achieve that, and therefore not doing it, let's figure out a way to live into this concept of ceasing and embracing in a time. Now, you know, we worship on Sunday, right? We Christians, followers of Christ, don't worship on the Sabbath. We worship on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the day on which Jesus was raised from the dead. It's the first day of the week. Sabbath is the last day of the week. For those literalists, Sabbath literally means sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And it's a rich tradition in the Hebrew faith in, in which they uh, dedicate their souls to worship of God and rest from labor, right? And the beauty of that is there's a kind of rhythm that causes all of that. And a part of it is set up in the Hebrew calendar. In the Hebrew calendar, a day begins in the evening, goes overnight, into the morning, and to the next evening. It's not like our day, right? Our day begins in the morning or midnight and works through the day, and then we end at night, right? This day starts in the evening and moves to the next evening. And there's a powerful rhythm in that that's very important. It goes something like this. We have an evening meal. We pray for the meal. We pray for our families and for the world. We bless our children. We bless our families. We bless the community and the world, and we go to rest for the night. It's much like the way we end our days typically, right? That is to say, after dinner, there's a kind of a wind down, whatever that looks like for each one of us, but we're getting ready for rest, right? If the day begins that way with uh, prayers and a meal and blessings and then going to sleep, and that's the beginning of our day, that rhythm sets us up well for how we're going to live into the rhythm of Sabbath. Because once we've sort of wound ourselves down for the rest, then once we've had the rest, guess what happens? I'm ready for the new day. I'm ready to celebrate who God is and what God is doing. I'm ready to uh, join with God in the workings of creation. I'm ready to celebrate all that God has set before me because I have started with rest and I've prepared myself for the activity of the next day. I love that. And that's what we mean by rhythm. What we mean by rhythm is entering into these rituals and these, these cycles that can help bring life. That's the intended goal of Sabbath. Not something that's cumbersome, not something that takes away, not something that diminishes, but rather something that can embrace all that God desires for us. And so rather than getting caught up in, man, I just got too much to do and there's no way that's ever going to work, I'll never be able to cram that in, I wonder if we can cease from certain things so that we can embrace life. Another way that uh, I've heard Sabbath referred to is Sabbath is for delight and communion with God. Wow, that's pretty powerful, right? Delight taking joy in who God is and all that God has done and the ways that God is at work and communion with God. I reckon in some ways that's kind of like the rest and the remembrance because the rest is resting from everything that separates me from God or prevents me from fully knowing God or being in that connection with God, right? I'm delighting in that or I'm resting from that. And then communion as we receive today, reminds us that we are in communion with God, that we're connected to God, and that's the remembrance. I reckon remembrance kind of has maybe two components. I mean, a part of it is remembering, right, intellectually. I remember everything you've done, God. I remember how you brought us out of slavery and into, uh, uh, out of bondage into freedom, right? But it's also remembering us with God that we are members of the body of Christ and we celebrate being reconnected with who God is and what God is doing in the world. That's remembering. And as we do that, we find a richer relationship with God. But we've got to be intentional about it. We've got to figure out why this is important because we live in a culture that values rush and accomplishment and achievement and going, going, going. And while there's clearly nothing wrong with accomplishing things and achieving things, 
when we do them to the degree that they keep us from fully knowing God and recognizing the wonder of God's relationship for us, it tears at the fabric of who we are as followers of Christ. So I wonder if we, if we begin to think of this rhythm, this rhythm of rest and remembering. I love the way David put it in Psalm 62. At the very top of the psalm, David says this in Psalm 62, only in God do I find my rest. My salvation comes from him. I find it fascinating that David is tying rest with salvation. And this glorious opportunity that if we will indeed find our rest, our peace, our wholeness in God, we will find that salve for our souls. We'll find that connection that God is desiring for our hearts. So if we do indeed take time for rest, time for rest of body and mind, of heart and soul, we begin to recognize that that rest can bring refreshment. It can bring a new kind of energy. It can bring a hope that might get lost in the hurriedness of life. It can help refresh our souls in such a way that it can change how we interact with people. And isn't it fascinating that rest is really built into virtually all living organisms. But we humans, who seemingly know better, can't seem to grasp hold of its purpose. I mean, just think for, with me for a minute about certain things. We know that, and I know we're not agrarian folks, but we know that one of the best ways to help crops grow better is that every seven to nine years we let them go fallow. We let them rest because the soil needs rest. It needs to be refreshed. It needs to be turned over, right? You talk to any bodybuilder who's working hard on those muscles and they'll tell you, I work hard and I rest. There are off days, right? There are rest days. How is it that a baby grows? Man, they come into this world sleeping and they sleep 20 hours a day because that's how they grow. They buy fully into that rest and the power of what that rest means. One of my favorite images is of a yeast dough bread, right? If you've ever made yeast dough, what do you do after you put the yeast in the flour and the, and the water? You let it rest, right? And as it rests, what does it do? It grows. It comes alive. <laughs> it has life. All of you living organisms know that rest is important for life and for energy and for moving forward. What makes us think we're any better? If the Lord of the universe, if the creator of all things needs to take time for rest, who do we think we are that we don't? God designed us for that rest, and that rest builds us up. It doesn't diminish or cause us to be lazy or uh, make us somehow less than. That rest is built into the vibrancy of our lives and the rhythms of our lives. And the remembrance is important, too. Because the remembering us to God, the reconnecting us with God is so critical to how we know God and how we know God's heart and how we remember the goodness of what it is God does for us and for the world. Many of you know Psalm 46. Psalm 46 is a powerful psalm. I want to encourage you to go read the whole psalm today. But many of us know Psalm 46 verse 10 but we may not know it by chapter and verse, but it goes like this. Be still and know that I am God. You know that verse, right? It's a powerful verse both of rest, be still, but also of remembering and reconnecting ourselves to God and know that I am God. And there's a beautiful prayer of this scripture. Remember last week we talked about praying scriptures, perhaps even memorizing scriptures. And this is a powerful way to do that. Some of you have done this before, I know, but I just want to walk you through a way to remember us to God and remember that God is the goodness in all of us and for us. We meditate on this one verse and we pull it back and then we build it back. And it goes something like this. 
Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Be still. Be still and know. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know that I am God. And as we pause and reflect, as we pull and as we grow, we recognize the richness of that relationship with God and what it is God can do in and through us. If only we'll take moments to pause, to ponder, to reflect, and to find refreshment. It makes a huge difference in how we face each new day and how the rhythm of life becomes more rich. But I know sometimes we get caught up in the overwhelming nature of Sabbath, what I need to do, how I must do. And occasionally that shuts us down. And every once in a while we realize, man, there are some legalists in the world and they, you know, they, they take it to the nth degree. And, and those of us who are chronologically mature enough in life, we remember when it was forced on us, right? When there were laws where stores couldn't sell products and restaurants weren't open and things couldn't be done. You remember those days. And some of us cherished that and, and loved it. And others of us, if we were kids, we hated it. But it forced stuff on us, and that's not God's desire. God's not, God is not a God of force. God is a, a God of relationship, of connection, of desire and yearning to be with us. And Jesus understood this. It's why when some of the legalists of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, were calling him out for healing and teaching on the Sabbath, he helps set them straight, and it happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but I, I love Mark's version in Mark chapter 2, and I specifically love the New Living Translation of what Jesus says about Sabbath because it's all about the rhythm. Jesus says this in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of humans or people, not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Wow. Wow. That makes a difference. That makes it more doable. Uh, Sabbath exists to help me. Sabbath exists to help you. Sabbath exists to help me understand this relationship with God and how I can uh, overcome barriers and problems and circumstances. And it helps give me life and hope and possibility. If only I'll enter into the rhythm. And make it real. If only I'll do something about this gift that God is offering all of creation. Remember, it's a part of the Big Ten. We can do this. It is possible. And so I'd just like to offer a couple of suggestions because rather than letting the concept shut us down, I want to bring it to the surface so that we can joyfully celebrate the gift. So one way to move forward, I just call these the four Ds. They're real simple. One is quite literally just determine. Determine that this is important. Determine that this is valuable to your life. Determine that you're going to make a difference about it so that something can be transpired by it, right? Let's just make that determination. We're not going to get overwhelmed. We're not going to throw it away. We're not going to determine it's impossible. We're going to determine it is possible and it is important, right? So that's a decision. The second is that we need to be deliberate. Be deliberate about how we set it aside. Remember, God's words in both Exodus and Deuteronomy were, consider the Sabbath holy. And when we consider that, sometimes we get overwhelmed by holy, I'm, I'm not holy. See how you, you have to talk different when you even use the word, right? And we get overwhelmed by holy, but all holiness means is set apart. 
I'm going to make this time, this space, this event, this Sabbath, I'm going to make it different. I'm going to be deliberate about it, and I'm going to... We know every, we, when, we, when we make things intentional, it's going to happen, right? I'm going to organize it. I'm going to commit to it. I'm going to work it out. I'm going to do it, right? So uh, when I um, am deliberate, it means I'm going to set that apart. I'm going to make it possible, right? The third thing is designate a time and a space. Now, I'm here to tell you, I don't believe Sabbath has to be 24 hours. If you do that, more power to you, and I think you'll be better off for it. But I believe we can do Sabbath in periods of time, blocks of time. It could be four hours or eight hours or 12 hours. It can be chunks of time. And just designate that so that you say, this period of time is going to be my Sabbath. I'm going to set it aside to rest and reflect and remember. I'm going to do it in this space, wherever that is. Get out of work, perhaps get out of home, whatever that looks like. I'm going to designate a chunk and start with something reasonable. Start with something you can achieve and rest from everything. Rest from the phone, rest from the TV, rest from work, rest from obligation, rest from the things that prevent us from being in a relationship with God. Designate it. Because when we do, that ritualizes it and it creates a rhythm and it creates an opportunity for it to be achievable rather than overwhelming. And guess what? Like many other things that we start small, Guess what it can become? It can become that 24 hours if we'll be deliberate about it and if we be intentional about it, if we determine that that's what we believe, right? Then it brings the refreshment, the encouragement, the opportunity. The fourth D, just do it. <laughs> stop making excuses. Stop thinking it's overwhelming. Stop, you know, creating blocks. Just do it and enter into that rhythm and discover the joy of rest and remembering. For those of you who do it, I know you know it's beauty and it's wonder. I know you know it actually makes you more productive, more effective, and more efficient. And how ironic that some of us sometimes think, I just can't make time. I just can't make it work. There's just no way. There's too many things. But it's proven, both spiritually and scientifically, that if we will take this rest and if we will remember our Creator, life becomes full. So my prayer for me and for us is that we'll discover a way to become unhurried, and as we discover a way to become unhurried, we will discover the rhythms of rest and remembrance. And God will be faithful always. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you. Thank you that you saw fit to take rest and that you designed us to take rest. Help us, Lord, to take charge of that gift, to use it as a part of the great rhythms of life, to develop a richer relationship with you and to become more empowered and encouraged in our everyday life. God, thank you for rest and for the ways that it calls us into right relationship with you. God, this is our prayer, and we lift it in the name of Jesus, whom we know to be the Christ. Amen. Hey, friends, for the great ways that you are generous and helping bring this fullness to life, I give you thanks. If you brought a gift with you this morning, there are some brown boxes right out the doors at the white posts. But I'd love you to hear a story this morning of how you, as a congregation, were generous this past week for some of our clergy around the annual conference and beyond. Listen as we share that story of your generosity. Pastor Doug here. Thank you for all that you do to help make mission and ministry possible here at Treach. I wanted to give you kind of a little behind the scenes thing about what's going on today. We're the church host site for all the clergy from the Northwest Texas Conference, Central Texas Conference, and North Texas Conference. Over 400 pastors in one spot. We had a great group of volunteers serving today to help make this big conference possible. 
you uh, were out in the parking lot bright and early this morning serving. You were preparing coffee, setting up tables, serving as greeters at all the doors, helping folks find the Family Life Center and then find their way back. Wow, thank you. You really helped make this day a success. If you want to continue to give, the way to do that here at TREAT is scan the QR code, go to tmumc.org backslash giving, or text the letters TMUMC to 45777. And as always, thank you for all you do. Every month we have the opportunity to gather together around God's table. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open table, and that simply means we believe God is the host of the communion table, and everybody is welcome to sit and eat and dine at God's table. So that means if this is the first time you have ever walked in this church or any church, you are welcome to receive this today. We'll be receiving communion today by intinction, and that just means that the server will tear off a piece of bread and dip it, and you will dip it in the cup. And as you come forward, I invite you to say your name so that the server can call you by name just as God calls you by name. After you receive communion, we invite you to stay at the prayer rails, and if you would like a prayer with a pastor, just simply hold your hands open so that we can see that, uh, see that you are requesting that, and we'll come and pray with you. It would be our joy to do so. And if you're gluten-free, the center left aisle is the one that you'll want to go to. And if you need, if it's easier for communion to come to you rather than getting up and going down the aisle, just simply let your usher know when they get to your row. I'd like to invite the servers to go ahead and come forward now. As Daniel said, we fall into rhythms of hurry where we tend to ignore commands of God, a command to rest. But there are so many other things that we fall short of even as we gather around this table. So let us go before God silently and confess our sins to God. But hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I am forgiven. We are all forgiven. On the last night, Jesus gathered with his disciples, and he, he took the loaf of bread, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same thing with the cup, gave thanks for it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, pour out upon these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we dine together at his heavenly banquet. It's through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. We pray this in the Lord's Prayer as your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ poured out for you. Come and receive. The table is open.
As we come to the close of our service, I invite you to stand and join us together. We sing One Bread, One Body. Indeed, as we gather on this Communion Sunday to celebrate the oneness we find in Christ, we celebrate all the richness that God has for us, those who have gone before us and those who are yet to come. also want to celebrate some of the newest members in the life of the church. I know you'll want to welcome them, those who've gone through the Next Steps class and completed their covenant. We welcome Mike and Stacy Merkins and their three kids. We celebrate with them and also uh, Denise McCormick and Chip Peach. Uh, we welcome them as well. I know when you see them, you'll want to greet them and welcome them into the household of faith here at Treach Memorial United Methodist Church. Now, it's hard to believe, but two weeks from today, Lent begins. It's that preparation of knowing what it, the journey to the cross is and the celebration of Easter. It's a powerful season in the life of the church. And this year, we're going to focus on meals with Jesus, some of the meals that Jesus used to teach others about his faith and what it means to be his follower. I'd encourage you to watch the screen to capture just a glimpse of what we're going to try to do throughout the season of Lent. 
The table is set with intention. The food lovingly prepared. Drinks and conversation flow with ease. When we share a meal together, we let our guard down, we experience gratitude, and we feel connected. Jesus shared many meals throughout his ministry, each one unique and meaningful. A seat is waiting for you this Lenten season as we learn from Meals with Jesus. Indeed, you heard about some of those meals already in the announcements. We begin with Ash Wednesday, A Meal with Jesus, and there'll be several throughout the season as well. There's a book that we want to encourage as a family to use, whether you are a single person, whether you uh, are empty nesters, or whether you've got young children or middle-aged kids. Uh, The Meals with Jesus book is a powerful book. It has daily devotions, takes less than 10 minutes of your day, but it's a powerful way for the family together, either at a meal or simply together, to acknowledge Jesus in our lives and for the day. So I want to encourage you, those books are available uh, right out at the information desk. And then finally, if you've ever worshiped with us online, and certainly if you're worshiping online with us right now, uh, you got a link this past week in an email to give us some feedback about our online experience. We always want that to be the best it possibly can, and your feedback will help with that. So I want to encourage you uh, either to use the link that's on the screen uh, or the link that was in the email that was sent to you. Friends, know that God's Sabbath God's rest and God's connection for us is for our own good and for the cherished relationship that we have with God. I pray that you'll take full advantage, and I pray that it invigorates your life, that it strengthens your faith, and that it encourages your soul. May we all go this day with that great thought in mind. May God's hope guide you every day. Amen.